TII item 435, July 23rd, 2017, iOS 10.3.3, Goldmaster. Welcome to Today in iPhone. Yeah, I like it a lot. Today in iPhone. Hey, Gola! Oh, yeah. My beautiful iPhone, which I never have out of my hand and that I do everything with and has become an extension of who I am. Today's episode is brought to you by RX Bar. For 25% off your first order, visit rxbar.com slash TII and use promo code TII at checkout. This episode of Today in iOS is brought to you by Casper. Get $50 off any mattress purchase by visiting casper.com slash TII and using promo code TII. Welcome to the show. I'm your host, Rob, and you are listening to the Today in iOS podcast. First up, I want to thank Francisco for sending in the artwork for today's show. Francisco wrote the following. Hey, Rob, this is me in front of my local Apple store at State Street in Santa Barbara, California. To add TII to the pick, I use the app Retype. Regards, Francisco. Well, thank you, Francisco, for sending in this artwork. And folks, you can see Francisco's artwork in the free TI app via the bonus button for episode 435 or at Instagram.com slash Today in iOS and also at Facebook.com slash Today in iOS. Francisco's picture continues to celebrate the 10-year anniversary of TII and the iPhone. Please, when taking a photo of yourself in front of your local Apple store, if possible, make a square picture as I have to make them square for iTunes. And put the Apple Store location on the photo along with TII or Today in iOS branding. Thanks to the many of you that are already sent in photos. And as always, send in pics to todayinios at gmail.com. And if you have some music you have created on your iOS device that you would like to share with the audience, please email that to me as well. And make sure to include which app or apps you use to create said music. Finally, the double dot updates that could finally did. And Apple, after six beta releases, released iOS 10.3.3 Goldmaster to the public on July 19th after first releasing the first beta for it back on May 16th, over two months for that double dot update. This one's biggest attribute is security improvements, specifically around Wi-Fi security. If you ever turn on Wi-Fi, this is an update you want to do ASAP. This patches an issue known as Broad Pawn, And on the U.S. National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST, on their severity scale, Broadpawn scored a 9.8 out of 10. Quote, if your iOS device has its Wi-Fi turned on, attackers in range could find your device, remotely take over its Wi-Fi chip, and crash your phone. Unquote. From Apple's document on this update, quote, for our customers' protection, Apple doesn't disclose, discuss, or confirm security issues until an investigation has occurred and patches are released and available, unquote. Which, of course, is Apple's way of saying, the news is out, best update now, as all the black cats have this info. Per Wi-Fi, Apple said this, quote, Available for iPhone 5 and later, iPad 4th generation and later, and iPod Touch 6th generation, The impact is an attacker within range may be able to execute arbitrary code on the Wi-Fi chip. A memory disruption issue was addressed with improved memory handling, unquote. Normally, I say wait a little bit, but given most people do turn Wi-Fi on at some point, I have to recommend that you update as soon as you can and before you turn on Wi-Fi. There are many other bug fixes, security improvements with 10.3.3, and it may be the last update for iOS 10. If you are interested in all the nitty-gritty details, there's a link in the show note titled Apple Released iOS 10.3.3. Note, not all the security updates were about Wi-Fi. There are Safari vulnerabilities that are fixed as well. If you use Safari browser, you should also update ASAP. Really, if you use your iOS device at all, you you need to update to iOS 10.3.3 ASAP. Apple also finally released the Goldmaster for watchOS 3.2.3. It is a minor update. Again, bug fixes and optimizations on this one. Make sure your Apple Watch is set to at is charged to at least 50% and place it on the charger and close to your iPhone. Then go to the Watch app on your iPhone to go to General, then Software, Update, and make it so. There were no reports of new features during the two-month-plus beta period, 
But in Apple specs for this update, they did also mention the same Wi-Fi issue as with iOS 10.3.3. So better get this one done ASAP. And finally, Apple also released tvOS 10.2.2 Goldmaster to the public. Go to Settings app on your fourth generation Apple TV, select Software Update to install. If you have automatic updates turned on, it may, should already be updated when you check. Again, no new features, just bug fixes, optimizations, and security fixes. And yes, you guessed it, Apple calls out the Wi-Fi issue. Thanks, Broadcom. This issue with Wi-Fi is, again, the same with the other iOS devices uh, and also with uh, the watchOS. It is the Wi-Fi chipset and not something because of Apple. Android devices have the same issue. They actually had a patch released in early July, which means in about 12 months, maybe 12% of Android phones will have the patch. For anyone with an iOS device, an Apple Watch, uh, or a tvOS device, the updates are available for you now for everyone, and you should do all of these updates ASAP. Let's switch over to talk about iOS 11 betas. The general feedback I've been getting is iOS 11 is more buggy on iPhones than it is on iPads and more buggy on new iPhones than on older iPhones. But it has become less buggy from when beta 1, say, was released versus where we are now with beta 3, for the most part. I really don't think this is all that surprising. Obviously, from one beta to the next, they should knock out bugs. And newer iPhones have more features, and that means more code to support those additional features and more chance for bugs. Remember one of my catchphrases, beta equals bugs, beta equals bugs. FYI, if you are having bugs, one thing I've always recommended, and it works here again, is with iOS 11, and that is where you go and force quit all apps, go to settings, general reset, and selecting reset network settings, for a few people that emailed me and that had issues, then did this, and, well, their major issues went away. I still don't recommend putting the beta on your primary iOS device that you need for work, only on secondary devices. Also, one report from iMore is that they have seen or been hearing of folks with iOS 11 beta that their data usage has gone way up. I have not heard of these same reports with our listeners, and checking my son's iPhones, they definitely are not having this issue. It's likely a setting that is not optimized, like allowing cellular assist and having a bad Wi-Fi connection or just having cellular turned on for all apps. For my kids' phones, I have Wi-Fi assist turned off, and I have cellular usage turned off for basically every game except Pokemon Go and a few select other apps that I want to make sure they... St- they are connected to the internet at all times. But in the last month, both running iOS 11 um, and both of their devices, both boys, uh, neither of them has used more than one gigabyte data. As a matter of fact, one of them is even less than 500 ki- megabytes. And those at iMore, when they're talking about having this data usage issue, they were talking about four gigs or more of data in a single day. In any case, If you are running iOS 11 beta, hopefully beta 3 or for devs and beta 2 for public, go to settings, cellular. You can see which apps are using cellular and how much. Apple announced that their Clips app received an update last week. This update included dozens of new graphic overlays and posters plus UI improvements to boot. Quote, users can now add classic Disney and Pixar characters to their videos Clips 1.1 features animated overlays of Mickey Mouse, Minnie Mouse, Donald Duck, and Daisy Duck. The app also includes characters from Pixar's Toy Story and Inside Out, unquote. And there is more. If you use Clips, check to make sure you are now on version 1.1. Plus, look for the link in the show notes for episode 435 that takes you to Apple's press release on this. And the title of that is Clips now features Disney and Pixar characters. Earlier this year, Apple finally allowed app devs to respond to customer reviews, you know, where you get that highly thought out, hey, your app sucks type review. You can now respond with, hey, up yours, and I have tracking services turned on, and I literally know where you live. Sleep well tonight in that south-facing bedroom with the blue curtains. 
Well, Apple is expanding the feature with rollout of a new customer support role where you can assign someone or someones to be about just responding to customer reviews on the App Store. That means now you can have multiple people say up yours to the ungrateful app users, or in some cases actually answer legitimate questions and comments. From Apple, quote, Apple says customer support reps will gain access to resources and help users and roles and my apps in iTunes Connect by clicking on my apps. They're able to jump right into the ratings and review and start responding to customers, unquote. I want to welcome a new sponsor to the show, and that is RX Bar. I've been eating protein bars for well over 25 years. I started eating them back when I was working out heavy when I played rugby in the early 90s. Some of those early ones were just downright nasty or really chalky, where you would need to drink about half a bottle of Gatorade just to wash it down. But I got used to them, and when I travel for work, I typically throw a few in my laptop bag a nice, much better dinner sometimes than the uh, peanut you get. Well, with RX Bar, there is no need to just get used to anything. No acquired taste required. They are really delicious from the get-go. RX Bar decided to take a different approach to protein bars and make them only out of natural ingredients. And then they listed those core ingredients right on the front of the package, like on my current favorite chocolate sea salt one, which says... Three egg whites, six almonds, four cashews, two dates, and no BS. That's written right on the front. RX bars come in 11 delicious flavors uh, to choose from. The blueberry and the peanut butter chocolate. Now, those both came in a very close second to the chocolate sea salt in my book. RX bars are gluten-free, soy-free, dairy-free. There is no sugar added. No artificial colors, no artificial flavors, no preservatives, and no fillers. Turns out real food ingredients actually taste really good. Who would have thunk? Well, evidently not those from the others I've been eating for years. With RX Bar, you can actually taste the real fruit and the spices like in sea salt. Again, these are delicious and not what you think of when I say protein bars. 25% off your first order is your, for yours for the taking. All you have to do is visit rxbar.com slash TII and enter promo code TII at checkout. These are what I will be throwing in my laptop bag when I go on business trips or when Apple Watch pings me now and says, time to get a cookie, I'm going to reach over and grab an RX bar. If you are looking for a great whole food protein bar made from 100% whole ingredients that taste delicious, then once again, go to rxbar.com slash TII and enter promo code TII at checkout for 25% off your first order. Hi, Rob. This is Mike Muir uh, from Indianapolis, Indiana. I'm a longtime listener of the show. Uh, I appreciate all that you do for us. Um, I was calling back with a note about the iOS 11 beta that was just released. I'm on the public beta, and I'm sure a lot of your listeners are as well. Um, and one thing that I noticed since the last beta update was that my visual voicemail was no longer working. I got a call. I sent it to voicemail. It still showed a notification as a voicemail. However, when I, you know, click on the voicemail screen under phone, all it says is call voicemail. This can be a problem since, you know, I haven't actually called my voicemail in years. I've just used the visual voicemail setup. And so to any other users that are having this issue, I've found a solution. If you go into your settings under your phone, there is a button that says change voicemail password. If you enter your current voicemail password, and then it prompts you to re-enter a voicemail password to confirm because it's basically changing your password, but if you enter your current password both times and it confirms it, then the visual voicemail reappears in the iOS 11 beta. So I hope this helps anyone else who's running the public beta, and I've already reported it as a bug on the feedback app, so hopefully they'll get that fixed before the next beta, but... I wanted anyone else who was running the public beta to know that there is a way around this and that it's an easy fix and can get that taken care of for them. Okay, thanks. Bye. Mike, thanks for that great feedback. Into the email bag we go. Hi, Rob. Per changing the key photo in the album and iOS, this is the official Apple way to do it. Quote, 
Open photos, touch the people album, touch the album of the person's photos. Example, open all the faces of John. Select at the upper right of the screen. So touch to select the upper right of the screen. Touch to the select uh, the photo that you want as the key photo. So a blue check is on the lower right of the photo. Touch the share icon, touch set key face. Hope that helps. Regards, Edgar Perez. Well, thank you, Edgar. Hi, Rob. In episode 433, you mentioned that iOS 11 will have the ability to lock a note in the Notes app and unlock it with your fingerprint. This functionality was actually uh, has been around in Notes app since iOS 9.3. To enable it, open the notes you would like to lock and then tap the share button in the upper right once the share option is one of these share options is lock note i use this for a note that contains my frequently used wi-fi password so i can easily copy and paste it after doing the reset network settings so i can then uh, text the password to other people also if needed thanks for all you do and keep up the great work regards daryl d daryl thanks for the feedback and oh i guess i missed that one Hi, Rob. Uh, this is Alex from Walnut Creek, and I just couldn't resist calling you about the app that uh, you said was addictive, which is the game, Paper.io. I've been spending hours on it, and uh, I will probably be spending some more. It is truly an addictive app. Uh, one note is that uh, it's worth paying two ninety nine to remove the ads because they're incredibly distracting and... Um, after that, um, it's, a, it's a very good ad. And um, I love it. And thanks for the great show. Looking forward to it every time. Uh, keep up the good work. Have best rest of the summer. Goodbye. Alex, thanks for the voicemail feedback. We are now over 3,500 members in our Google Plus community and growing. Thanks to everyone that has joined, and thanks for the great posts. One new post in the Google Plus community, they had a bunch of comments that went up since the last episode was from Myron Euchre, who said the following, quote, for those considering the beta, I thought I should mention that between iPad and iPhone, I found the beta to be much more stable on my iPad Air 2 than on my iPhone 7 Plus. My iPad has hardly had any issues, but my iPhone crashes on a regular basis, plus notifications don't work on my Garmin watch. Also, other than the new control center and do not disturb while driving, there are very few changes to the iPhone. I will say that I have yet to find one of my apps, uh, not counting 32-bit apps, that doesn't run. In the past, I've had often several apps that either would crash on, on startup or didn't operate as expected in the other betas, unquote. And Francisco Tapia replied, quote, Beta 3 seems less stable for me than Beta 2. I'm writing up a radar bug report to Apple, just, but just curious if you or anyone else is having pro issues downloading apps off the App Store, unquote. Robert Spivak replied, quote, There are more tentpole features on my iPad, but there are a lot of great improvements in iOS 11 on iPhones too. You just have to look around harder to find them, smiley face. A few of my favorites, uh, take a screenshot and a miniature thumbnail appears in the left corner. Just tap on it and you can immediately mark it up, draw notes on it, comment on it, and then share it via text or email. The new app style layout with a large tile screen for most Apple apps, notes, mail, etc., is a preview of what some third-party apps will also implement, many devs copies, uh, that was a copy Apple style and UI guidance. Apple navigation now gives you lane information at the top of the screen. This is huge when driving on multi-lane freeways. It now tells you which lane to use for an upcoming exit. My old school built-in nav system uh, in my car has done it for years, but everything else about the car seems so bad. I still use Apple's nav instead. The automatic Wi-Fi password handling when tethering to another device is really nice, especially if your Wi-Fi passwords are long and cryptic to, to boot. Uh, just a few immediate things I use. There are lots more, unquote. Amico friend replied, quote, I like the screenshot feature too. 
I also it also lets you delete the screenshot if you don't need to save it in photos. Another feature I like is to be able to edit photos using third-party apps without leaving photos. And it doesn't create duplicate pictures. The edits are saved on the original. I use Photoshop Express and Metafo often, and they work uh, in photos. Screen recording is nice, too, when reporting bugs or trying to show how to do something to others. I couldn't use it at first, but figured out if you have restrictions on, you have to enable it under Game Center in Restrictions all the way at the bottom. And then, uh, let's see. Also, to Francisco Tapia, I can update existing apps but cannot download apps that's not on my iPhone. Uh, never mind, I had a problem yesterday, but it seems to work okay, unquote. Uh, and then John Diller replied, quote, Robert E. Spivak, uh, the missing lane guidance has been the only thing keeping uh, Google Maps on my phone. Looking forward to, leading, to deleting Google Maps, unquote. And there were many other comments in this post as well. And since the last episode, there were also dozens and dozens of other new posts and comments in the TII Google Plus community, which is an Android fanboy zone and a spammer-free zone. Yep, it is the most civil Google Plus community covering iOS. Folks, go to todayinios.com slash community to join in. Thanks to all 3,500 of you already in the community and contributing. Also from the Google Plus community were these comments per the last episode, which I always try to remember to pin to the top at the community uh, for that latest episode. From Myron Euchre, quote, Interesting hearing a listener say he fears he may have to buy a new car because he doesn't have a way to plug in his iPhone into the stereo. Why not buy an aftermarket stereo that has Bluetooth capability? I did that when I got tired of using FM adapters, unquote. And for Bra from Barbara E., quote, My 2014 Honda Civic ha was supposed to have iOS in the car, which became CarPlay, and it did not, never will. But it does have Bluetooth ha series hands-free capabilities, so I like that. I hate the Honda Link blah, blah, blah. It's awful, but I like the rest of my car. Uh, and the phone can initiate calls. I can answer calls using the steering wheel. I never have to have my iPhone out of my purse, safety first, and I have a playlist on my phone and can play all kinds of music through my stereo system, unquote. And speaking of feedback, um, only Edgar Perez took the time to go into the TI app and leave a comment from inside the app. Edgar said, quote, cool new design, Rob, unquote. Well, thank you, Edgar. And folks, if you don't want to go to the Google Plus community, you can comment on a specific episode now via the TII app. Just go to the episode and click uh, on the little comment icon, and I it will ask you to sign in via Facebook and leave a comment. And if you are not on Facebook, well, there is always Google Plus community. Hopefully now we have you covered via email, Facebook, Google Plus, plus voicemails, if you want to comment on this show, you can and should be able to. Random tip time. This is one that some say works really well, and others say did not notice any difference. And it is how to clear the RAM to make sure your iOS device runs faster. Hold down the power button only until you see the slide to power off message, then let go and hold down the home button until the screen goes blank and your home screen reappears. And then go and either enjoy a new Snappier iOS device or think you are enjoying a new Snappier iOS device. I saw an article on thestreet.com, which was, of course, negative on Apple. They always are on that site. Despite the fact that Apple has the largest market cap of any company in the world, those on Wall Street just never seem to get Apple and for some reason always write negative articles. It is uh, as if Steve Jobs or Tim Cook at some point uh, stole all their kittens and puppies from those that work on Wall Street. But I digress a lot. Back to the latest article titled, quote, Former Apple Exec, It's Sad to See Apple Slipping to the Position of Follower, unquote. First, the executive in question is Hugh Dubberly. And he said, quote, 
Steve is gone, and so the creative direction is gone, unquote. Obviously, Mr. Doubly has intimate one-on-one experience with Steve Jobs from the past, right? Why else would he say this and the street.com report it? Well, let's look at when Mr. Doubly worked at Apple, and that would be from 1985 to 1994. Let's think about that. When was Steve Jobs not at Apple? Oh, yeah, 1985 to 1997. Okay, so right there, this article should have been killed. But it was not. So let's respond to the rest of the article, which is basically Apple is slipping to a position of follower rather than leader. Apple is a leader in software. They are a leader in profits. But when it comes to hardware... For the most part, Apple has not been the leader ever since Steve Jobs came back in the 1990s, after Mr. Dubberly had left. I mean, they were a leader with the Newton, and we saw where that were, how that worked out for them. And they were a leader with the first real laptop and the first GUI interface on the Mac, but none of those things led to Apple's current fortunes. Nope, the current turnaround really was on the iPod which was not first, second, or even third MP3 player on the market. And then they followed by the iPhone, which was not the first, second, or even third smartphone on the market. Then the iPad, which again was not the first, second, or third tablet on the market. And then Apple Watch was not the first, second, or third smartwatch. What Apple does is they make their devices better end-to-end and make it mass-producible, more so now than in the past. When Apple first rolls out the iPhone 8 in September, it will need to be made with components their suppliers can produce over 80 million of in a quarter. That is really, really, really tall order for many companies. Their suppliers have to band together and have to get this out in in an unheard of time frame. Remember that we get, uh, as we get into this next segment of the show, Apple's not a leader. They are a follower and have been for quite some time, especially when Steve was at the helm. Where they lead is actually bringing together all of the tech into one really easy-to-use package that can be mass, mass, mass produced. And that is, again, no easy task. That is actually where Tim Cook's strengths lie in the supply chain. That's why Steve had the foresight to to elevate um, Tim to CEO. Steve knew it was more and more going to be about supply chain. That is not sexy. That is not exciting. But it is so necessary for what has become launches of unparalleled magnitude each fall from Apple. No one else comes close to doing what Apple does each year. Again, we'll reference back to this whole segment later on in the episode. I want to once again thank Casper for supporting our show in 2017. We love our Casper mattress. It is by far the best mattress in the house. But don't just take my word on how good their mattresses are. There are well over 20,000 reviews in Amazon and Google with an average of 4.8 stars. It is quickly becoming the Internet's favorite mattress. Why did they get such great ratings, you ask? Well, Casper mattresses combine supportive memory foams to create an award-winning sleep surface with just the right sink, just the right bounce. Casper is an obsessively engineered mattress at a shockingly fair price that an in-house team of engineers spent thousands of hours developing. It is designed, developed, and assembled in the U.S. They offer sizes from Twin to California Kings with a great price, and with Casper, you get a 100-day risk-free trial period. You don't like it, you get your money back, and they come and pick it up and donate it to charity. If you go to casper.com slash TII and use promo code TII, you'll save $50. Terms and conditions apply. This is an American-made mattress with delivery right now for the U.S. and Canada only, and it is free delivery. And once said mattress is delivered, it is from UPS in a squash box that you think, no way is there a mattress in there, but you get a cool little tool to cut open the package, and the mattress pops open and expands to form. It is really cool. Just Google Casper Mattress Unboxing. You order online, and it is delivered to your door. So no need to go out in the heat to get this either. Again, to save $50 off, go to casper.com slash TII and use promo code TII, all lowercase on the promo code. Again, casper.com slash TII, promo code TII to save $50. 
Thanks, Casper, for the great mattress and for sponsoring the show. For the past 10 years, 11 times total now in a row, I have spoke about iPhones, iPads, and all things iOS, watchOS, and TVS OS at Kansas Fest, which is the only global Apple II conference. They have been doing this conference since the 1980s. This is my favorite conference to talk at. As I just try to have fun with the talk, I created a couple of really fun slides this year looking back over the past 10 years to see what are some of the things that launched in popular culture after the iPhone. Well, there, of course, is the Game of Thrones TV series that launched in April 2011. The movie Inception came out in July 2010. Glee, the television series, premiered in May of 2009. The first Iron Man movie that kicked off all the Avenger movies was in May of 2008. Uh, Breaking Bad premiered in January of 2008. The Big Bang Theory was September 2007. And yes, even Mad Men debuted after the iPhone, and it came out in July of 2007. So that puts how long we have had the iPhone into some popular culture perspective. I also had a slide that went over how many units were sold all time for some key product lines. The Apple II, as well, it was an Apple II conference, sold about 6 million units all time. The Mac computer, basically all Macs since 1984, have sold 222 million units or over that will be yeah, bumped up a little bit here shortly. Ford Motor Company, since 1903, has sold 366 million cars and trucks. Sony has sold a little over 400 million Sony Walkmans since 1979. And all of that pales in comparison to the over 1.5 billion iPhones and iPads sold in the past 10 years. Yes, more iPhones and iPads sold than all those other items combined. And just think, Apple's biggest critics are always complaining that Apple is charging too much and it's costing them market share. Another thing uh, I like to talk about uh, at these presentations is covering what was announced in the past year and how I did on my predictions for what would be announced and then make predictions for the next year. The presentations are always in the latter part of July between the the 15th and the 30th, somewhere in that range. You can look online and find my presentations from past years. But last year in particular, I pretty much described the iPhone 7 Plus to a T. Not because I had some insider info, but because so much had already been leaked and I just did a good job filtering out the BGR Digitimes BS and concentrating on the realistic rumors. The only thing I really missed on was saying the 7 Plus would have it, the smart connector. And this is basically two months before, or was two months before Apple's announcement last year for the iPhone 7 Plus, and everything was already fully known. Now, I bring all this up because there's an article in Business Insider titled, quote, Apple says it's cracking down on leaks, unquote. They talk about an interview John Gruber did with Phil Schiller where John asked Phil about how it seems uh, leaks to the press seem to really anger Apple. And Phil said, yes, yes, they do. And that they are going to double down on secrecy. And at first, reading this article, which came out on the 16th of July, I was like, yeah, good luck with that. Tim Cook said the exact same thing two years ago. And per my previous comments, last year, the iPhone 7 Plus was pretty much fully known Um, about two months prior to the announcement. But as I was working on my presentation for this year's K-Fest, I realized I was not anywhere nearly as confident as I was last year. Back in April and May, I was getting ready to sell my Apple stock because I had not seen realistic leaked photos yet, leading me to think maybe there was no new iPhone coming in 2017. What is out there this year seems like a lot of spaghetti being thrown at the wall. The quote-unquote new rumors uh, coming out uh, since July 1st are all over the place. I have 25 different articles I have flagged with iPhone 8 rumors again since just July 1st. This actually tells me that maybe their efforts this time on secrecy are working better Then in the past, either that or the iPhone 8 really, really, really is delayed and not coming at all. Um, And in either of those cases would not be good. So let me 
quickly go through some of the rumors I highlighted in my own personal notes since July 1st. From Mac Rumors, we had the following seven headlines. Quote, all 2017 iPhone models said to include standard 5-watt USB-A adapter with wireless charger sold separately, unquote. Quote, Apple reportedly investing in LG Display's new OLED plant will be solely devoted to iPhones, unquote. Quote, Apple working on improved security systems for iPhone 8 that replaces Touch ID with facial recognition, unquote. Quote, iPhone 8 may feature rear-facing 3D laser for improved autofocus and AR, unquote. Quote, leaked iPhone 8 screen protector includes reduced bezels and front-facing camera cutout, unquote. Quote, Ming-Chi Kuo predicts iPhone 8 will omit Touch ID entirely, come in limited color options, unquote. And, quote, persistent software problems with iPhone 8, wireless charging, and 3D sensor causing panic at Apple, unquote. Again, those just from Mac rumors and just since July 1st. Now let's move over to 95 Mac, where we have eight different rumors to cover, starting with, quote, Apple reportedly preparing three new iPhone models for 2018, all with OLED displays, unquote. Quote, JP Morgan, OLED iPhone 8 will arrive on time in September in small quantity ASP of $1,100, unquote. Quote, KGI iPhone 8 features highest screen to body ratio in industry, but lacks touch ID fingerprint scanner of any kind, unquote. Quote, latest iPhone 8 dummy images further corroborate glass back in screen touch ID more, unquote. Quote, report all three new iPhones yet to start mass production. OLED iPhone 8 supply may not ramp until November, unquote. Quote, report iPhone 8 could pack rear-facing 3D laser for AR features and camera improvements, unquote. Quote, report iPhone 8 to come in four color choices, including new mirror-like model, unquote. And finally, quote, Sketchy Report claims new iPhone SE coming in August, iPhone 8 event in October, unquote. And again, those last eight were just sent or just found in 9to5Mac. And since July 1st, the previous seven were Mac rumors. Both of those sites have better hit rates than most. At least they don't seem to just make crack up purely for link bait. Speaking of which, that leads us into these rumors from BGR which seems not to have any issues with the morality around link bait. Here are four articles from BGR. Note, there were many others. I just could not get myself to link to them. Quote, exclusive images reveal Apple's iPhone 8 looks like power, what that looks like powered on, unquote. Quote, I might know the truth about Touch ID on Apple's iPhone 8, unquote. Quote, report Apple's a $1,000 iPhone 8 won't actually cost that much, unquote. And, quote, the iPhone 8 design was confirmed, and it's not the one everybody hates, unquote. As you can tell, three of those were kind of clearly link bait. I flagged five other articles from other sites uh, from iClarified. Quote, Apple just has just weeks to fix iPhone 8 touch ID issue, unquote. From Gonj Tech. Quote, the fingerprint sensor is turning into the iPhone 8's biggest mystery, unquote. From Apple Insider, quote, iPhone 8 back with no touch ID, unquote. From gadgets.hdtv.com, quote, iPhone 8 may feature fingerprint sensor on power button, report claims, unquote. And finally, from Redmond Pi, two articles, quote, iPhone 8 versus iPhone 7 side by side design comparison, uh, using dummy unit, unquote, and, quote, iOS 11.1 said to unlock wireless charging functionality in the iPhone 8 after device's launch, unquote. Okay, I want to reference back to our earlier article about Apple being a follower and needing tech that is mass producible. One of the articles said the biggest mystery around the iPhone 8 is the home button and touch ID, and I agree. We have a few different items mentioned here. Obviously, there is also uh, it is it will be the same as is. So there's that's option one. But so far, none of the leaked photos or mockups 
or any other rumor show the iPhone 8 with a actual home button on the front of the screen. So let's assume Apple only doubled down on security and did not raise it to the power of 100, and that some of the leaks are real. That means no home button on the front of the unit. That then leaves us with four possible ways Apple could unlock the device. One is put the sensor right into the screen. Um, you put The other way would be to put the Touch ID on the back. Or you could put the Touch ID in the power button or use a brand new 3D facial recognition technology. The ability to sense your finger through the screen, that tech has been demonstrated. It's new and it's not as secure as the current home button. That means it's not ready for prime time. Kill it off the list. On the Putting it on the back, while well, that might be okay for Samsung, that is a horrible user experience. Kill that off the list. 3D facial recognition is so problematic. See articles about people using pictures to unlock devices using this tech. Again, kill that off. And that leaves us really only with the power button being where Touch ID could be. And, and that's it. My, I, nothing says the Touch ID needs to be a round button. I mean, and of all the options, this one seems the most likely for the masses when you're trying to build 80 million proto uh, units in a, a quarter. And in my speech, that was my prediction for the iPhone 8. Next to my predictions is looking at the rumors, all being about having three iPhones this year, having and some of them, all of them having OLED screens. So some of the rumors lately have been three new iPhones in 2017 and all three would have OLED screens and pictures showing what, and you know, you have see the pictures of what the iPhone seven S seven S plus and the iPhone eight would look like side by side. Here's what is interesting with the iPhone eight going basically edge to edge on the sides and a very, very small bezel up top and at the bottom, the screen for the iPhone eight winds up being 5.8 inches diagonally versus the 5.5 for the seven plus but the size of the iPhone 8 itself is actually just a tad larger than the iPhone 7. Everyone is assuming there will be three iPhones announced, the 7S, the 7S Plus, and the 8. Please explain to me where the iPhone 7S and 7S Plus fit into this product line. Why would Apple update new 7Ss and 7S Pluses when the iPhone 8 is the same basic size of the 7 S and the 7 and has uh, a screen larger than the 7S Plus. I'm not seeing the value beyond offering up the other items at a lower cost. And the best way to offer them up at a lower cost is not to update them. What if the lineup was the 7, the 7 Plus, and the new 8? And the only new announcement was the iPhone 8. If anything, Apple could update the iPhone SE also to better processor, getting it in line with the 7 and the 7 Plus. But per the iPhone 8, what I also predicted at the conference at KFest was, of course, the A11 processor, the 2.5 gigahertz clock speed, staying at 3 gig of RAM, improved battery life, up to 24 hours, 3 gig talk. The dual cameras turn 90 degrees, that yes, the iPhone 8 would have the rear 3D laser autofocus from one of the rumors mentioned just a few minutes ago to help with AR applications. Storage would bump up to 64 gigabytes minimum to 512 max because I am so tired of saying 32 not enough gigabytes, and I'm an optimist. It would have wireless charging option, pad sold separately. Thanks, Apple. It would have the new ProMotion technology for the display with 120 hertz refresh rate and an OLED screen, that would go edge to edge, and the home button would be on the power button. Those are my predictions based on filtering the rumors above and taking what PGR said and to cancel out those options. Back to Apple doubling down on security. I will say I am not very confident on my predictions this time around. Some are more me being an optimist, others just about what I think is possible at 80 million units a quarter. And again, back to the 7S and 7S Plus, I don't see the value in them at all. If the iPhone 8 really does have the edge to edge 5.8 inch display, why would anyone buy those items beyond cost? 
And in that case, Apple is just best to reduce the price of the current 7 and 7 Plus. Thanks again to the folks at KFS for inviting me uh, to speak. If you are an Apple II enthusiast, you really should look at attending. They are a great group of folks, and they meet right here in Kansas City each July. Hey, Rob. This is Steve from Arizona. Long time no talk to. Just wanted to give a hint if anybody, as I did, bought the iPad Pro 10.5 and the smart keyboard. If you notice, if you type on the keyboard and try to use the apostrophe key, you will, it will not work. I called Apple Care, and they had no clue and said I could bring it back to the Apple Store. I then went in, before I did that, I went into general in settings keyboard, and there's this, when you have it connected to the smart keyboard in keyboard, smart keyboard mode, you see something called hardware keyboard. It's set automatically to auto keyboard. When you change it to English, the apostrophe then works. I mentioned this to the Apple tech support person. She said she never heard of it. So my guess is lots of people buying the iPad Pro 10.5 with the smart keyboard are not going to be able to use the apostrophe unless they make this change. So, again, you go into general settings, keyboard, hardware keyboard, and change auto to English, assuming you're in an English-speaking country, and voila, the apostrophe then works. Hope all is well, Rob. I've been buying all sorts of Apple products, iOS products, but that's for a later call. Talk to you later. Take care. Bye-bye. Steve, thank you very much for the feedback and the tip there on getting that working. And now we're going to go into the email. Actually, we're going to go right to the Google+. Plus. And this one's from Myron Euchre. And he wrote, quote, A new feature in iOS 11 allows you to archive an app and not delete its settings. Do we know whether it's safe to do this during the beta period? Sometimes in betas, Apple points devices to test versions of iCloud, etc., and resets it from time to time. If they did that, would we lose the archive data? Would they do that for a public beta or just developer beta? Unquote. And I, I need to remind you, Myron, of this. Beta equals bugs. Or as Francisco Tapia said, consider betas for second-use devices, not primary devices. And definitely do not do something that would risk putting needed data in harm's way. Back to email. Back. Hey, Rob. Love the show. You were asking some of the new features that we like in iOS 11. I recently went on a trip and used the updated Maps app. The new features I like are, one, Siri does a, a more thorough job of indicating what lane to stay in or what lane to exit on. Two, the Maps app also indicates the speed limit, what the speed limit is, which is convenient when driving in an area you're not familiar with which is why you're using Maps app in the first place. Three, the little blue dot that indicates your location now has an arrow that shows you uh, what direction your phone is pointing, which is convenient, especially when walking. Overall, I appreciate the updates, and I think it made uh, navigation or navigating less stressful. Thanks for all you do. Regards, James from Macomb, Michigan. Thank you, James, for all that feedback. Hello, Rob. It's Daniel from Wisbeach, Cambridgeshire. Apologies for my voice. I've been to the Silverstone F1 Grand Prix, and I was doing a little bit of shouting. So my voice may go a little bit Scooby-Doo. Anyway, I do not have some uh, witty, clever comeback. Um, what I do have is, is full appreciation for your beautiful listeners for helping me out with my one password dilemma. Side note, when you said that little quip at the end, it reminisced me about Sansa Stark shooting down Peter Baelish in the latest Game of Thrones episode. I felt like Littlefinger with all my clever little comebacks being shot down in flames. So, now that I have started this voice memo, I don't actually have anything else to say, per se, uh, apart from obviously thank you very much to loads of listeners that have introduced me to ShareSheet. 
I didn't think that ShareSheet would be the place that would contain one password. I thought that was pretty much for just sharing pictures of my anatomy to various women via the ones that I get to find their phone numbers via Twitter. Uh, not Twitter, Tinder. <laughs> oh, dear. See, you've thrown me, Rob. You've thrown me. I feel like Peter Baelish. I'm sulking away like a little rat. Uh, but what I would like to say is the podcast app's a little bit broken. I do hope they fix that. Um, the the uh, um, the way round it, of course, is to download the world famous TII app, which I'm actually going to do today because I feel that me and you have gone on our little journey now for so long that it's time I jumped on straight in bed with you. So I'm going to be very happy to say I'm going to download the TII app and fully integrate myself into the world of today in iOS. Rob, um, I love you. I do sound like a little bit of a stalker now. So I um, apologies for that. Anyway, just a quick note. Seriously, I will come back with something not funny and clever, but something like interesting and iOS related in the future. But I just want to continuously say thank you very much to your lovely listeners who are beautiful. But you know what else is beautiful? Your face. Love the show. Love the face. Love this new voice. And as always, <laughs> have a nice day. Daniel, thank you, as always, for your feedback. And how do you know it's my face and not one I borrowed from the Hall of Faces? On a past episode, we talked about an alarm clock from Palo Alto. It was on episode 425, time code 31 minutes and 22 seconds, and you can see an unboxing video on the TII app for it. Well, Palo Alto has a Kickstarter project they let me know about, and it's called Sandman Doppler, the world's best alarm clock, unquote. And searching for Sandman, one word in Kickstarter will bring up the details on this. They had a goal of $25,458 because, hey, why not? And they have already had pledges of over $93,000. So congrats, Palo Alto. So what is the Sandman Doppler? Well, it is an alarm clock with six USB ports on the back. It has speakers and plays music. It is a smart alarm clock, and it has Amazon Alexa integration. If the Amazon Echo and the original Sandman alarm clock mated, this would be their child. Pricing on this is just $89 if you are willing um, to be a beta tester, or $119 if you want the finished version with the nicer fit and finish. Both units will function the same. Beta units will ship in March 2018, Fit and finish units will ship in July 2018. And if you have a bunch of USB-C devices, you can have three ports uh, changed over to be USB-C ports. And the other three remain a standard USB. Pricing for an Amazon Echo alone is much more than this device. So it is a very good price, especially if you get the beta unit, 89. Search for Sandman at kickstarter.com or in the show notes for episode 435. And speaking of things I have been sent, I have one to review, and that is the Earin M1 wireless earbuds. Earin is one word spelled E-A-R-I-N, because you know they go in your ear. These are not replacements for Apple's AirPods. These are focused on playing audio well. There is no microphone. These are what I use when I travel on flights now. Unlike Apple's AirPods that let too much background noise through, and you have to turn them all the way up on a flight to almost to hear something. These block out the background noise, not noise cancellation, but blocking out noise. And you can comfortably listen on a plane to music or podcasts. They come in a very nice cylinder case where they get charged up, and uh, just like Apple's AirPods do in their case, except the case is of higher quality fit and fill. If you like your music, and like in-ear headphones. These are the ones I can definitely re recommend. As they say on their site, no cables, no microphones, no flashing lights. We have focused on the necessary so you can focus on the music. They made them as small as possible, about half the length of the AirPods. So if you want your in-ear headphones that don't look like you have a cigarette sticking out of your ear, these are the headphones for you. They even have an app so you can tweak the audio experience to meet your personal tastes. 
to find these, search on Amazon for year in, one word, E-A-R-I-N. Pricing right now is $99 for Amazon Prime members. Looks like it's $149 if you're not a Prime member. If you would like to see the unboxing video for these, go to the TI app and look for the item between episodes 434 and 435 titled, you guessed it, Ear in M1 unboxing video. I think I mentioned on the video I'd reviewed them on episode 430. Well, I wanted to really, really test them out, and I have, and they are very, very nice. And again, they are what I now take with me when I travel as my in-flight headphones and what I use when I want to chill out at home and listen to some music. Thanks to the folks at Erin that supplied these for review. This was not a paid endorsement. Hey, Rob. Ask Siri, are you green? Regards, Andreas G. Are you green? It's true. I'm 100% powered by renewable energy sources, like the sun, wind and water, and hopes and dreams. Are you green? Siri runs on 100% renewable energy, so ask away. Are you green? I run on 100% renewable energy, which means I don't need fossil fuels to tell you who that guy was in Jurassic World. It was Chris Pratt. Are you green? I run on 100% renewable energy, so feel free to speak up. All your requests are carbon neutral. Are you green? It's true. I'm 100% powered by renewable energy sources, like the sun. Are you green? I run completely on renewable energy. Which is lucky, because tracking down dilithium crystals is a lot harder in the 21st century. Are you green? I'm completely powered by renewable energy. It's where I get my sunny disposition and the wind beneath my wings. Are you green? I run on 100% renewable energy, which sure beats hamster wheels. Thanks again to Casper for their support of TII. If you go to casper.com slash TII and use promo code TII, all lowercase, you will save $50 off a mattress shipped right to your door. Again, go to casper.com slash TII and use promo code TII. Before we go today, I want to remind you to send in your feedback to the show, 206-666-6364. That's 206 Moondog. Or record your feedback and email to the show at todayinios at gmail.com. Feedback can be a question or comment for something someone said on this episode, or it can be a question or rant you have about something else. An app, a product review, good or bad, as long as it is iOS related, it is welcomed. I'm always looking for new artwork to feature that you create on iOS device. Just put some TII branding on it and send it in. And of course, we're always looking for more music created on iOS device to play on the show. It's your show and your feedback is greatly desired. Also, don't forget to check out our moderated Google Plus community by going to todayinios.com slash community. And a quick reminder, if you are an app dev or an iBook author, email me if you want your app or iBook featured in the promo giveaway for segment for free. We just need the five promo codes or more to give away. Simply email me at todayinios at gmail.com and please include a 60-second or less audio review of your app or iBook indicating you are the dev or author in the recording. Also, when you send in the promo codes, please make sure to let me know when they expire. Thanks again to RxBar for sponsoring this episode. Folks, go right now to rxbar.com slash TII and use promo code TII at checkout for 25% off your first order. Finally, check out the newly updated TII app, which is free to you. Just search for TII in the iTunes App Store. It's the best way to consume the show and to get push notifications each time a new episode of TII is released. It is fully voiceover friendly, of course. And part of this latest update, we added in the ability for you to be able to comment directly on the episode from inside the app, and that can get shared to a website. This is a big improvement over the past way, which there wasn't one. So again, go to the iTunes App Store, download the TII app, just search for TII, and get that on your device. Until the next time, I'm your host, Rob, reminding you to phone different. This show is hosted on Libsyn.com and part of the Wizard Media Network. If you are looking for hosting, go to Libsyn.com, that's L-I-B-S-Y-N.com for hosting for your podcast and for creation of your own smartphone app. The Today in iOS podcast can also be found on the free Stitcher radio app. Just search for TII.